Thanks very much, everyone, for attending tonight. This is a very exciting event that I've been um, very happy to help to organise. So we'll welcome from the Australian Fabians Victorian branch to all the people who are attending tonight and to particularly to our three speakers for this event, Steve Murphy, Mark Wakeham and John Wiseman. This is the second event in a three-part series uh, looking at the future of worker power in the Australian economy. <clears throat> this event is particularly going to focus, this particular event is focusing on the role of organised labour and the future of industrial strategy. Uh, my name is uh, Sarah Howe, I'm a member of the Fabians Executive and I'm going to be moderating this evening's discussion. So I'd firstly like to kick off with uh, proceedings with a welcome to country. Uh, so in the spirit of reconciliation, the Fabian Society acknowledges the traditional custodians of, the country, of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'm going to now um, just introduce the meeting structure for tonight. Um, so the structure of the meeting will be that we've, we'll have our speakers on for 15 minutes each, taking us through to 8.30 p.m. During this time, we're, we were hoping everyone could remain muted um, so that we have sort of, um, <clears throat> sort of a quiet background for the speakers. Um, but at 8.30 p.m. when we move on to the online Q&A session, you'll just need to unmute yourself when you want to um, when we ask you to ask a question. Uh, we'll be taking questions to our speakers via Zoom, Zoom chat and you can put a question up on the Zoom chat throughout the proceedings as the speakers go through their um, talks. And um, at, at the conclusion of the speeches, we'll um, attempt to pick out questions that reflect the main themes that emerge. The chat's going to be visible to all of you, or, or to the event team at least, during the presentation. Um, around 8.45pm, we're going to wrap up the discussion. And after the formal meeting, everyone's invited to get some refreshments and join us in chat rooms in a sort of an online pub style environment. <laughs> More details when we get to it. But I'd now like to um, introduce the main event and give, give some background to it. Over the last four or five decades, we've seen a significant shift to a move to a more neoliberal policy environment in government. Given this, the Australian economy has come under increasing international pressure, which has put pressure on many jobs in the labour market. We've lost much of our manufacturing se sector. It's down to 9% only of the labour market now. We've seen the collapse of the vehicle industry, which has devastated regions, um, particularly Elizabeth, Geelong and um, broad meadows and so forth. And we've more recently seen the airline industry coming under enormous pressure because of these policy settings. We're now over-reliant on fossil fuel and mining exports and we've got a current account deficit as a result. The impact of this economic environment has placed workers in the labour market in a very precarious position. And um, unions and organisations that represent workers and the progressive movement as a whole are grappling with how, how we can come up with a, a progressive public policy response to tackle this structural decline of um, the middle sector of the labour market. So in this event, we're going to address the question of industrial policy and workers' power to influence the kind of work that is available to them in Australia and indeed the, their agency and capacity to shape structural change in the labour market. We're going to be asking questions in this event, such as how can we transition to a more advanced economic standing within the global economy with a stronger focus upon industry? How can we create more highly skilled, secure, rewarding and socially useful jobs for Australian workers? Can we build sovereign Australian industries and leverage our renewable resource assets what would be the role of trade unions in such a transition policy? So tonight, <clears throat> to help us through this uh, very important topic, we're very lucky to have three outstanding speakers who are well placed to tackle these big questions given their important roles that they occupy within academia and the trade union movement. So I'm going to introduce the speakers as I move through the event one by one. 
And I'd first likely, I'd first like to introduce uh, Professor John Wiseman as our first speaker. John is a <clears throat> professor, prof sorry, professorial fellow at Melbourne University's Sustainable Society Institute. His uh, main focus there is on strategies for accelerating the transition to a just and resilient zero carbon society. He works in the fields of climate change and sustainability, sustainability risks and challenges and the consequences and drivers of globalization, regional eco economic and employment priorities and community wellbeing and social justice policy frameworks and strategies. So I'm delighted to uh, invite um, John to present as our first speaker tonight. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples on whose land we are meeting and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to begin this presentation with a quote from Sharon Burrow, um, former president of the ACTU and now general secretary of the International Trade Union Congress. The quote goes like this. There are no jobs on a dead planet, but there's no hope and no economy without jobs. A just transition requires us to both engage in dialogue and make sure that no one is left behind. Sharon's quote leads to three propositions which I'd like to briefly explore over the next 15 minutes. One, the ethical and strategic case for creating a just transition for workers and communities in accelerating the shift to a zero carbon society is increasingly clear. Two, organized labor has a crucial role to play in maximizing the potential of the energy transition to create secure, high quality jobs and inclusive, resilient communities. And three, key success factors for accelerating the transition to a just and resilient zero carbon society include proactive, collaborative, well-coordinated planning, respectful, inclusive engagement with workers and communities, mission-oriented industry and economic renewal pol policies, and strong ongoing investment in community infrastructure and services. So let me just go through those three points over the next 15 minutes, 14 minutes probably at this point. We don't need to look any further than the, the really terrifying climate fires which have recently engulfed the west coast of the United States to be reminded of the importance of keeping the climate emergency at the center of our ethical and strategic and industry policy priorities. Accelerating a just transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy is clearly an essential foundation for an emergency speed reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. The 2015 Paris Climate Agreement calls on all governments, including Australia, and I quote, to accelerate emission reductions taking into account the imperatives of a just transition of the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs. The 2018 COP24 Silesia Declaration on Just Transition Principles builds on this foundation to note that a just transition of the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs are crucial to ensure an effective and inclusive transition to low greenhouse gas emissions and to enhance public support for achieving the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement. Recent international and Australian experience continues to strengthen our understanding that broad political support for economic decarbonisation depends on communities and workers being fully convinced that there is a strong and lasting commitment from all levels of government to create secure, high quality alternative employment opportunities. Now, as Professor Ross Garno notes in his recent book, Superpower, Australia is in fact extraordinarily well placed to emerge as a global superpower in renewable energy, low carbon industry and absorption of carbon in the landscape. As he says, no other developed country has a comparable opportunity for large scale, firm zero emissions power supplied at low cost. And the Million Jobs Plan recently launched uh, by Beyond Zero Emissions provides a terrific demonstration of the enormous employment opportunities which could flow from accelerating Australia's emergence as a renewable energy superpower. Well-planned strategic investment in renewable energy, energy efficient buildings, transport and manufacturing industry, 
and in sustainable low carbon land use has the potential, BZE argues, to create well over a million jobs over the next five years. But as the 2018 United Nations Just Transitions report notes, the job creating potential of environmentally sustainable energy transitions cannot be taken for granted. And while reaffirming that, yes, managed well, a transition to environmentally and socially sustainable economies can be a strong driver of job creation, of social justice and poverty eradication. The International Labour Organization has also recently cautioned that the job creating potential of environmental sustainability is not a given. Strong proactive industry policy and strategic leadership from government and organized labor are needed to ensure transition strategies do indeed deliver high quality, secure, long-term jobs. Jobs that provide adequate incomes and social protection, safe working conditions and respect for rights at work. Recent international experience provides a range of lessons about key success factors for accelerating the transition to a just and resilient zero carbon society. And I'd like to, in the second half of this presentation, highlight four factors of particular relevance to current Australian energy transition and industry policy debates. One, proactive, well-planned strategies for a just and orderly phase out of fossil fuels are surely going to create far better outcomes than reactive emergency action after closures are announced. In Germany's Ruhr Valley, collaborative planning combined with strong public investment in transport, education and research, environmental technologies and cultural and service industries continues to underpin strong economic renewal and employment outcomes. In Ontario, Canada, the successful implementation of plans to close all coal-fired power stations between 2007 and 2014 highlights the importance of building broad political support for an orderly closure process backed by adequately resourced redeployment, retraining and economic renewal strategies. In Spain, the Spanish Minister for Ecological Transition Teresa Ribera has recently announced funding of 250 million euro to support workers and communities affected by the rapid closure of that country's remaining coal mines, which once employed over 100,000 miners. Closer to home, the very short notice of closure provided by the owners of the Hazelwood power station created huge challenges clearly for workers, households, businesses and governments seeking to regenerate regional jobs and investment. And while longer notice would clearly have made the task far easier, state government investment of over 330 million combined with the policy coordination and engagement work of the Latrobe Valley Authority have played a key role in revitalizing employment growth. So between September 2016 and October 20, 2019, over 10,000 new jobs have been created in the Gippsland region with unemployment in the city of Latrobe falling from 11.1 to 7.1%. Point two, Respectful and inclusive engagement with workers and communities is an essential foundation for creating the social license for just and rapid decarbonisation. Mm. The German Coal Commission brought together representatives from government, industry, union, scientific and environmental organisations to identify pathways to an equitable and orderly phase out of coal. Their recommendations include allocating 40 billion euros to address economic and employment challenges in affected regions. In Canada, key success factors identified by the Coal Transition Task Force, developed in collaboration with the trade union movement, community and business representatives include close engagement with unions, community organisations and local government every stage, leading to a comprehensive long-term action plan, which is nationally coordinated, regionally driven and locally delivered. The Government of Scotland has also recently established a broadly based trans Just Transition Commission to advise on the best ways to plan and implement a rapid transition to environmentally and socially sustainable industries and jobs in Scotland. As Australian energy transition researcher Amanda Cahill notes, reflecting on her extensive experience in working with Australian coal mining communities, quote, 
the only way we're going to effectively deliver the two seemingly competing objectives of strong climate action and secure livelihoods is to deepen our engagement with regional communities, not just coal workers, but also farmers, local business owners, First Nation groups and others. Point three, mission-oriented industry policy and economic renewal strategies building on regional strengths will be an essential basis for pandemic recovery policies, driving rapid decarbonisation and high quality employment growth. Proactive, well-coordinated investment in pooled redundancy, retraining and re-employment programs are all clearly vital initial steps in addressing regional employment concerns and impacts. Recent European regional transition experience also demonstrates the importance of longer term economic renewal and diversification strategies informed by mission oriented industry policies and smart specialization principles. Those principles include identifying and building on regional strengths, developing a shared vision for regional innovation investment and establishing collaborative governance involving workers and communities, industry, government and universities. All around the world, labor movement organizations and social democratic governments are bringing forward visionary, comprehensive pandemic recovery proposals, focusing on the huge potential for energy transition investment to drive rapid reduction, emission reductions and create high quality long-term jobs. A few examples. Recommendation one of the 2021 Canadian Labor Congress budget submission recently launched argues that the Canadian government should, on a quote, set out a plan with clear benchmarks and timetables for achieving Canada's greenhouse gas emissions targets, committing $81 billion over five years to expand renewable energy, home and building retrofits, public transport, and just transition measures supporting workers and their families. In Europe, we see European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen launching the 750 million euro next generation pandemic recovery plan with the following statement. This recovery plan turns the immense challenge we face into an opportunity, not only by supporting the recovery, but also by investing in our future. The European Green Deal will boost jobs and growth, the resilience of our societies and the health of our environment. In the US, the Biden plan for clean energy revolution and environmental justice includes funding commitments of over $2 trillion. And yesterday, the Chinese government committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2060. In Australia, we have a government whose vision for green recovery seems to primarily still focus on swapping a fondness for fondling coal, for an obsession with subsidizing gas, and a magical faith in the mirage of effective and affordable carbon capture and storage. As a number of people have commented, a roadmap full of dead ends that ultimately leads over a cliff is probably worse than useless. And last point, point four, continuing to build inclusive and resilient communities will require strong ongoing support for the most vulnerable workers and households. As uh, Samantha Smith, coordinator of the International Trade Union Congress Just Transition Centre notes, long-term investment in health, education and community services, as well as in broader economic diversification, industry policy and labour market programs, will play a crucial role in strengthening the resilience and revitalisation of regional communities. Deindustrialisation, Smith argues, can tear apart the economic and social fabric of communities starting a vicious spiral where a declining tax and revenue base means less funding for public services, more employers and workers moving away and fewer jobs. But as she concludes, reversing this cycle and revitalizing communities takes plans and sustained effort. It also takes investment in infrastructure, public services, schools and hospitals. In short, all of the things that draw employers and families back to the region. So, Learning from international experience is crystal clear. A well-managed just transition to a prosperous zero carbon economy depends on proactive mission-oriented industry policy and regional renewal strategies, respectful and inclusive engagement with workers and communities, and adequately funded, well-coordinated public investment 
tailored to regional strengths and informed by local experience. Mark and Stephen will, I'm sure, be able to provide a wide range of Australian reflections and examples exploring these issues further. In concluding, I'd like, however, to return to and perhaps leave you with uh, the broader, increasingly tough and urgent climate justice challenge, which I think is reflected in Sharon Burroughs' opening quote. The question I guess I'll leave you with is, how do we continue re to reduce emissions at the speed and scale capable of preventing the planet being well and truly cooked while continuing to create high quality jobs in inclusive, just and resilient communities? Thank you. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you, John. That was an excellent start, start to the evening um, and fantastic to get that the international learnings and I think you've segued nicely into the next uh, into introducing Mark and Steve as sort of talking more about the Australian uh, stuff, but we'll no doubt have lots of questions for you later on. So thanks again. That was fantastic. Um, <clears throat> our second speaker is Mark Wakem. So Mark works at the ACTU as a senior advisor, climate, energy and just transitions. Prior to that, he worked, he has worked in leadership positions for Australian environmental NGOs for almost two decades. Most recently, he was the CEO of Environment Victoria prior to coming on board with the ACTU. So we're very fortunate to have him tonight. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, I'll let you sort of Take it away. Talk about where you're going to, yeah. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and Great. Uh, really lovely to be here. Um, I'm on Wurundjeri land tonight um, and I pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, because I'm on Wurundjeri land, it means I've been locked down like many of you and uh, it's nice to see a bunch of you on the call who in an ordinary year I would have probably run into by now. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, host disabled participant share screen sharing. And whoever's the host, allow me to share. Jeff, that's you. <laughs> oh, I think that might be Chris. Um, I, I'm sorry about this. Uh, Chris, are you able to um, enable? It. Yep, it's working. Thank you. So I, Sarah's asked me to talk um, a bit about the ACTU's and Australian Union's um, economic recovery plan and how we align it with a um, climate agenda. Um, so I'm not going to dig too deeply into just transitions. I will talk a little bit about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with what our approach has been in tackling the moment we're in. And then as we sort of move on from the health crisis phase, um, how we build a forward looking agenda that tackles both problems, um, COVID, economic recovery and uh, climate change. So uh, for those who haven't seen this image before, it's called um, Warming Bars. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an artwork essentially that shows um, the increase in average temperatures over the last 150 years. And um, the white years are the average uh, temperature years, the blue years are cooler than average, and the red years and darker red years are warmer than average years. Um, the darker the colors get, the, the warmer or cooler it has been. So you can see, this is um, for Australia, and you can see that we are, we've had all of our hottest years on record in recent years. So this problem still exists, despite the fact that we've been focused on a much more um, immediate problem. So the first point I want to make is that, um, you know, some commentators like to try and characterise um, our choices around the pandemic as being either trying to protect health or trying to protect economies. And the truth is that it's the countries that have done the best job of protecting health that have also done the best job of minimising damage to their economies, which is what this graph shows. Um, the, the countries up here that, that have had the least mortality, this is, this is uh, about a month old, this graph, so unfortunately it doesn't include a lot of the Victorian deaths that have happened um, mainly in aged care. Um, but then it, uh, the, the uh, vertical axis shows uh, the 
shows the decline in size of GDP. And you can see that it's, you know, as the mortality increases, generally, the impact on uh, GDP has been higher. So we don't have a choice. We need to, you know, if people who are obsessed with protecting the economy need to care about the health crisis. It's not a matter of letting it rip. And the second point I want to make is that we're in a really deep recession of our choosing, essentially, through the, the policy choices that we've made. We wanted people to stay at home um, to slow the spread of the virus, and it's worked very well. And you can see that we've had these huge spikes in unemployment. This is ABS data um, uh, just released last week. And then if you look at hours worked, we've had an even greater fall. So um, you know, uh, the, the analysis suggests that while you know, official unemployment rates might be around 7%, if you factor in um, underwork and people you know, um, who have left the labour market, real unemployment may be closer to something like 20%, which is as bad as we've seen. Uh, since the Great Depression. So I'm moving very quickly through some of this context, which you'll be fairly familiar with. But what we've seen is that COVID's exposed a bunch of existing fault lines um, across the community. So it's most impacted the most insecure segments of the labour market. So women, young workers, and workers in precarious and insecure jobs, casual workers, um, people on casual contracts, people on uh, visas um, who are in Australia uh, with, with a, a visa to work. It's had a disproportionate impact on particular industries, both through the impact of the pandemic and the government response. So higher education, tourism, creative industries, hospitality and aviation have all been smashed. And in the case of you know, higher education, um, aviation, arguably creative industries, um, it's, it's largely been, and hospitality even, it's largely been the policy response that has excluded um, businesses and individuals from applying for JobKeeper that has really exacerbated um, the, the loss of jobs. It's exposed the fact that a lot of our public services are weak as a result of, result of decades of privatisation. So we've really seen a stark difference in how publicly run aged care has performed in terms of um, privately for-profit aged care in terms of um, rates of infection. And we've also seen higher education model, which has increasingly been aimed at international markets, really um, getting to strife as a result of um, the pandemic. And we know that every recession increases inequality, but this one is having a particularly uh, dramatic disequalizing effect because of the concentration of job losses and reduced hours among workers who were already among the worse off in the community at the start of the pandemic. Um, there has been some upsides. Um, you know, we've, we've probably got a new appreciation for undervalued work, uh, work that's you know, undervalued in terms of pay, conditions, um, and, and sometimes prestige. So manufacturing, teachers, health workers, supply chain, supermarket workers, and scientists. Where you know, It's nice that we're listening to scientists again, um, who we've um, been ignoring for so long in Australia. So it's interesting you know, when you're in a real crisis, who comes to the fore and keeps the country running. So at the, the response of ACTU and Australian unions has been to try and tackle this moment that we're in in three ways. And the first has been to try and address the health crisis. So um, unions have been successful in getting pandemic leave for many workers, not all workers. Um, a number of state governments now have pandemic leave policies in place, which means that people, you know, if, they're, if they've been tested for the virus, don't feel the need to go to work um, because they'll lose their job. Um, or because they won't be able to pay their rent. Um, unions were at the front of the, the calls for masks and social distancing at work. Um, second approach has been to try and limit the economic damage. And um, there's Sally McManus and many of the other leaders of the um, union movement did an amazing job in essentially proposing the idea of JobKeeper to try and keep people in their workplaces and maintain that connection with their employer. And that's been pretty successful despite the fact that a bunch of industries have been excluded. Obviously, we've had to look after workers who have been made redundancy, redundant and support their entitlements. And a lot of workplaces have had a sort of emergency rules when it comes to um, industrial relations, uh, which has enabled, you know, workplaces, for instance, employers to give people less shifts than they otherwise might need to under agreement. So there's been an incredibly um, impressive and 
immediate response to the moment that we've been in. And I think that um, it's been quite an invigorating moment for unions, actually, um, to really be at the forefront of the crisis um, or responding to the crisis. And then finally, you know, we've, been, we've turned our minds to what is the economic recovery plan for this deep recession that we're in, um, the need for it to be a re of really massive scale, like the planning that happened towards the end of World War II, and it needs to not just be trying to get back to where we were, but try and address the critical failures in the business-led economy that we had before COVID hit. So, you know, vast underutilization of labor, growing prevalence of insecure and precarious jobs, widening inequality, persistent wage stagnation, and of course, um, the impact of climate change, which I'll now talk about in a little bit more detail. So, um, why do we need a climate lens to the recovery? So for three reasons, I mean, 2020 really has been a pretty ordinary year, hasn't it? Um, this photo was taken up near Coffs Harbour at the start of the year. Uh, and unfortunately it was one of many devastating photos that I could have chosen. Um, but we know that the climate crisis is not going anywhere. Um, we're seeing, you know, firefighters and firefighting equipment that were used in uh, Australia last year now being deployed in California and in days or weeks will be needed back here in Australia. Um, we're in deep trouble. It's a major threat to lives and livelihoods. We know that climate change threatens economic well-being, and we're being told that by every economic regulator, increasingly the world's largest companies, um, and we're starting to see the physical impact um, of climate change on the economy. And thirdly, because um, you know, the, the, the shift to low emissions and the investment that that's going to require could provide one of the greatest economic opportunities that we've ever seen. Um, and uh, the, the fact that we need to reconsider and remake large parts of our economy um, in a fairly short time frame um, brings with it all sorts of opportunities, also threats and pitfalls. But um, when we are looking at deploying tens of billions of dollars or hundreds of billions of dollars to respond to the moment we're in, um, why not tackle our other huge challenge that is um, bearing down upon us? So, one of the reasons climate stimulus makes so much sense is that it's so jobs rich. Um, so if, if the graph here shows different ways that you can spend public money um, to, to create jobs and uh, direct expenditure on social services, so education, health, that's the most rapid um, way of creating jobs. However, clean stimulus measures to address um, global warming are right up there among the biggest job creators. And I'll talk a little bit more about what some of those measures are. So it, it just makes sense from an economic perspective, if you want to create jobs to actually focus your expenditure here. And other parts of the world, EU, Korea, South Korea, um, Japan have recognized this and are putting huge amounts of money into sustainability projects and um, climate related projects. And for instance, the EU has committed a quarter of its 750 billion euro recovery package for, um, for climate initiatives. And when you look at the different types of initiatives that you could take in the climate space, the ones that can be deployed really quickly and that can generate a lot of new jobs and economic activity in the regions um, are, are things like renewable energy infrastructure, building efficiency retrofits, um, sustainable transport infrastructure, ecosystem improvement and repair. And when you think about you know, for all of those communities hit, uh, affected by the fires where ecosystems were completely gutted, that's a huge opportunity to invest in uh, landscape restoration, getting those areas and, and nature back on its feet in those areas, industrial energy efficiency, um, clean research and development and education and training. So th these are the ones that we can move really quickly on. Of course, you don't want to sort of start um, shoveling out the money on these projects without an overarching policy and strategy. And we know that we need to get to net zero, um, depending on whether we think we can achieve 1.5 or 2 degrees um, 
limit warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees globally. We need to get there by 2050 at the latest for wealthy countries like Australia. We really need to be getting there well before that, ideally, uh, which means we need to be upping our ambition for 2030. And as we all know, um, Australia's climate targets for 2030 are insipid and we don't plan on meeting them anyway. We plan on using um, sort of fake uh, carbon credits to claim that we've met our target. And as John highlighted, um, you know, the, 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 the Paris Agreement includes um, a commitment to a just transition. And around 50 countries globally will be going to the next UN Conference of Parties. And not only will they be taking their nationally determined contributions, so their targets that they're going to try and meet for emissions reduction by 2030 and their long-term emissions reductions targets, but they will also be taking a national just transition plan. Around 50 countries have made that commitment that they'll, they'll develop a just transition plan. And we're obviously a very long way away from that at the moment um, in Australia, where um, government is really asleep at the wheel, at least federal government. And then we need to get um, serious about looking at the sectors of our economy and developing industry policy across these pillars of decarbonisation. That's a, um, a slide Frank Yotso pulled together, where we move to zero emissions electricity, we electrify everything that we possibly can, um, we reduce emissions from uh, processes and products, heavy industry, steel, aluminium, etc., and we start um, uh, sequestering carbon through um, through forestry, planting, soil management, etc. Um, some think CCS, but it's likely to be pretty expensive and some decades away at any scale. And then, then we can act really quickly on those stimulus opportunities, um, making our really poor housing stock much more efficient, recover, recovery of ecosystems, repowering heavy industry, building the grid um, that we need for a renewably, a renewable, um, a renewably powered country. And can you imagine sort of the additional benefits that we would get if as we were rolling out those poles and wires throughout regional Australia to build the renewable energy zones, we were requiring that they uh, were manufactured with Australian content, Australian made steel. It could be one of the, you know, the, the real drivers of a green steel industry in Australia. If we were requiring that they were um, using low emission steel uh, and then helping us repower our economy with renewable energy. And there's a lot of opportunities in industrial energy efficiency as well. Um, you know, this gas conversation we've been having, which has been all about, you know, gas supply, there's been so little focus on where are we using the gas? What are the opportunities to reduce the need to be burning gas, whether it's to keep our houses warm or to, um, to, for food manufacturers um, or plastics manufacturers? So we've done some deep work with um, the Centre for Future Work. I saw Dan on the call tonight and with Jim Stanford there, looking at some of these opportunities in a bit more detail. I haven't actually been tracking how my time is going. I, mean, I, I think I'm probably getting pretty close to time though. So I won't go into this in any great detail, but we, you know, we can be looking at government procurement rules to ensure that we're maximising local contract, content. Um, we can be supporting manufacturers who are shifting to renewable energy um, through zero interest loans. We can have accelerated depreciation on energy efficiency upgrades, um, which will pay back very quickly and, um, and will then make these businesses able to employ more people. As I've mentioned, investing in um, upgrading the national grid. Supporting R&D development, sorry, R&D activities um, in technologies related to sustainable manufacturing, particularly around, you know, greening some of the heavy emitting industries like aluminium and steel. Um, and, uh, and also in looking at some of the new opportunities uh, in, in battery manufacturing, for instance, or other um, clean energy technologies. And, you know, you would have probably seen in the, the you know, the, the so-called technology roadmap that was released yesterday, there was some conversation about, you know, green aluminium and green steel, but there were actually, there was no deadline for any targets and no money on the table. So at the moment, it's, it's sort of a, a nice thought with no plan. Um, John also mentioned cluster policy and, you know, regional clusters that have been successful in transition strategies around the world, particularly in Europe. Um, 
we think that there's an opportunity in federal budgets to be establishing some of those uh, sustainable manufacturing clusters and a real opportunity to put some money into the um, sort of Roscano superpower idea, which would see us become a renewable energy exporter and an exporter of, um, of products that were um, processed with renewable energy in Australia. Final uh, slide or two. Um, so we've had this bizarre um, conversation around a so-called gas-fired recovery. I'm not going to go into that in any detail, except to say, if you're going to choose one industry to pursue at a time when more Australians are out of work than have been for decades, um, you could not choose an industry that has less jobs in it than the gas industry. Um, it is a very poor employer. And so this is what the Australian Institute's done, comparing all of these different industries and the jobs per million dollars worth of sales income. And you can see that gas is right at the bottom of that. And if you decided that you wanted to invest in that industry anyway, you could not choose a worse time to do it. The, the graph on the left, left shows the value of the largest oil and gas companies on the planet and how it's been written down to less than half of its value just, just um, two years ago as a result of collapsing oil prices, collapsing demand globally amidst, um, amidst COVID. Uh, and these companies are taking their plans to invest in gas and oil projects and shelving them. They're writing off projects. So the idea that government would enter the market now and underwrite new projects is kind of insane. Um, so finally, um, the other thing that we shouldn't lose sight of is how quickly the world is changing. Um, some of you would have seen that last night, about this time last night, um, the Chinese president, and there's a lot of issues and problems in China at the moment, but there was a real um, ray of light last night with an announcement by the Chinese president that China would um, aim for net zero emissions by bef before 2060. So China now has an earlier target date for net zero than Australia does, which is pretty disgusting given that our, um, you know, our emissions are four, four times higher per capita. Um, obviously, we need greater efforts, um, but we saw last week, just a week ago, the EU commit to 55% reductions by 2030. And John mentioned the Biden plan, which could see, you know, if, you, if we see the EU, um, China and the US really put their mind to it, the world could change very quickly. So it's really in our best interest to get on the front foot of this energy transition, which is inevitable, which is happening anyway, and make sure that it delivers for workers in the community. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, very interesting to see what the ACT is thinking is around um, developing a new green industry policy. And um, I'm particularly interested in the the clusters, actually, the sustainable clusters that you were mentioning, because I had I did a PhD looking at um, what they were up to over in Europe as well. So <clears throat> they're transforming the gas um, guzzler car sort of industry into an electric vehicle industry, particularly in places like Spain. But anyway, it's, I'll move on. Um, we can have lots of questions emerging, so that's terrific. I'm going to now introduce our third speaker, <clears throat> who is Steve Murphy. Um, Steve is now, well, is the incoming National Secretary of the Australian Manufacturing Workers' Union. He's worked for the AMWU since being elected as a workplace delegate, as a young tradesperson in the New South Wales Hunter Valley. Over the past year, he's been working with environmental organisations to build consensus on a transition away from fossil fuel fuels that puts workers at the centre. So we're delighted that he's made the time to be with us. It's going to be very interesting to get the... AMWU perspective. So thanks, Steve. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners mm -hmm. of the land on uh, where we all are tonight. Um, for me, I'm on Darug land, uh, I'm close to Parramatta, and I wish to pay my respects to their elders, leaders, warriors, past, present, and emerging. So I'm Steve Murphy. I'm the National Secretary of the AMWU, Australian Manufacturing Workers Union. I started in that role on Monday this week. Prior to that, um, I was the State Secretary in New South Wales. So our union has traditionally been known as one of the militant progressive trade unions in Australia. 
uh, well respected for our industrial power, but also for our thoughtful approach to the challenges that face working people. And we represent workers across a broad range of industries, including metal and manufacturing, food production, the automotive industry, uh, packaging, printing, maintenance, and mining services. And I joined the AMW as a young apprentice and with the education and mentoring from working class leaders in our union, I've been lucky enough to be entrusted with various leadership roles over the time that I've been a member of the union. From when I was first elected as a, a workplace delegate, and I'll never forget that, um, through um, working for the New South Wales branch of our union and ultimately the state secretary there. And as of Monday this week, um, to be our national secretary. And that kind of progression doesn't happen by accident at every single level in our union, whether it's a snapshot of our structures today or a picture of our great leaders over time, we've built our union and our structures to be primed for rank and file leadership. Um, as, a, as a union, we, we work to build a culture where there's pride in working with your hands in using your skills, your knowledge and your problem solving abilities in exchange for wages. And, we've played an important role in ensuring that there's some level of fairness in that exchange. But we also fight hard to retain the full scope of what worker politics means. And it means more than just winning good wages. AMW members know that our work doesn't stop at the factory gate. Look, we fight for secure jobs across our industries. We fight for work, safe workplaces everywhere, for respect and recognition for the work that workers do, a truly equitable health and education system, a safe place where people can live, a healthy environment and a peaceful world. And in that tone, I really appreciate the invitation to come along and talk tonight. The scope of tonight's discussion is exactly the conversation that we need to be having at the moment. And I'd like to thank both John and Mark for their valuable contributions and insight and acknowledge and thank Sarah and Jeff who have put this event together and did a little bit of work um, inviting me and getting me along to, to speak tonight. So thank you very much. The, the Fabians um, do play a vital role in our labour movement, setting the standard for what a member-led think tank can look like. And it's heartening to note the phrase of, our members are the heart of everything we do in your mission statement. And this is something that we also thrive and strive for uh, in the AMWU. Uh, in many ways, for us as a trade union, building a structure around our member leaders is the only way that we can ensure that we're not captured by this third party bargain agent frame that big business and conservative politicians have continually tried to typecast us into. Now, ultimately, maintaining our members as the driving force of our organisation is the only way that we're able to retain our space as being an important part of a movement for change. So since the start of the global pandemic, AMW members across Australia have sat with the same questions set out in the scope of this evening's event. They've been asking and talking about with each other what work is going to look like for their kids. How are we going to find our way out of this mess into a more equal society? How is this government going to use our public money to determine who the winners and losers amongst Australian struggling industries are going to be? And importantly, is manufacturing going to be one of them? Um, and lastly, how do we get a seat at the table about, around these discussions? Um, rank and file leaders from across our union will soon be stepping out of their workplaces and their industry silos being asked by our union to form a national campaign committee to build our efforts to bring a vision for workers to life. And we've still got a while to go until we're ready to launch this campaign, but I want to share with you a couple of the key themes that are consistently washing up when we have these type of discussions. We want to build something that is bigger, fairer and smarter. Bigger meaning we've got to pull ourselves out of this crisis by investing in future industries, including whole of supply chain capabilities, and think about the contribution that these make to a more decent, healthy and equal society. Fairer, we've got to radically overhaul work so that future generations actually know what it means to have a decent job. And it has to be more than just legislative, we've actually got to put the fight back into the working class. And smarter, our governments and industry uh, and even our own movement really is poorer for an echo chamber for, for an echo chamber of experts. And that's not in, anti-intellectual on my behalf. It's just a frustration that when workers aren't included, we don't get a chance to articulate what the problem is, to share how it impacts upon us, or to express a view on how we can help to fix it. So that's what we're building, a campaign that fights for bigger industry, for fairer jobs, and for smarter decision making led by working people. 
in putting together my notes this evening, um, I came across a quote from Jack Mundy um, that put this kind of vision into language that's far more eloquent and poetry, poetic than and I could ever hope to be. And in his article, A Wider Vision for Trade Unions, he posed a, a moral question on how should we use our labor and our right to have a say in the end result of what our labor produces? And what he said was, an enlightened public debate on socially useful production and consumption, hours of work and the nature and purpose of work could be a pre prerequisite to the winning of a sustainable system of socialism, a socialism with a human face, an ecological heart and an egalitarian body. And I think that quote really neatly guides us on how we need to build ourselves out of this crisis to, to, to something that makes us more hopeful. It touches on two key elements that I think are, are central to us winning as working people. Firstly, a recognition that the left can't win in small silos or fix this crisis one issue at a time. We've got to build a big holistic vision and prosecute it without blinking. Secondly, we need to foster an honest and thoughtful public debate with workers at the center of it about what the future of our industries that they are the custodians of are going to look like and talk to them about how we can shape that so that we've got a future for all of us. So in terms of bigger, it goes without saying that there's a mood right now across the public and appetite for bigger industry to carry us, carry us through the worst effects of the ongoing health and ec economic crises that we find ourselves rolling through as each, each cycle of, of the economy moves. And many of us have watched uh, as more and more of our movement even have been, have been capitulating to the idea that handing away massive pockets of our local industry capacity through free trade agreements is just going to serve us well into the future. Well, that experiment should be well and truly over for anyone who isn't an executive of a multinational corporation. That's not to say that we shouldn't be a trading nation, but in order to build back our industry capability, we need to be honest about what actually serves workers and the communities out of these trade agreements and what is simply our governments acting as a profit enhancer for capital. And we can't let the neoliberal fictions kind of guide our thinking in or out of this crisis that we're in right now, whether it's the folly of free trade agreements or the lie that gas is some sustainable labor intensive future industry. Whatever we invest our collective national efforts into next has got to satisfy a bigger criteria than just an injection of cash and a slow return to business as usual. And AMW's remem AMW members remember the economic and social good that came from having entire manufacturing supply chains based here in Australia. And the car industry was a great example of that. It drove in investment in research and design and retail and countless other occupations across the supply chain. It cultivated significant industrial power for working people. And, and we could think and act and bargain collectively across an entire industries and, and workers knew exactly how to exercise that power. So if you're working in a gearbox factory, you know you could, could pull up the whole supply chain if, if you were not treated right or the value of your labor was not being respected. The more we build industries in Australia that are end-to-end -end considering a whole supply chain, the more certainty that we will have for investment, the more certainty we'll have for industry, and the more certain that we will have for certainty that we will have, sorry, for workers' future. Um, and in this future vision, a big point of discussion amongst AMW members has been about our future energy needs. We must acknowledge that this, we need to put to bed this poisonous debate about what our future energy, energy needs are. What's frustrated me most in this debate unfold over probably the last decade is that we just seem to have these politicians trying to make a name for themselves by being in increasingly absurd, making statements and proposals, and they never stop once to think about the toll that this actually takes on workers that are driving those industries. So right now, with COVID-19 crisis, the climate emergency, we actually need to come together and land a consensus that one, respects current and future workers. Secondly, gives the environment a chance. And thirdly, acknowledges the crippling effects of energy prices. Uh, conservative politicians uh, would have workers believe that these three things can't exist in harmony. And it's really important on us to call it out for what it is, and that is absolute fiction. We know the only thing that is stopping Australia from genuinely leading the world on renewable energy and building a sustainable labor intensive energy sector is bodies like the Minerals Council and their patrons that are influencing decisions in our parliament. One of the most absurd things that, you, that we are told continually is that business delivers good jobs. 
And we have to challenge and end that fiction spun by these groups that any industry naturally provides good jobs. Work is inherently exploitative. The only thing that delivers good jobs is strong unions. The only reason that jobs in mining and maritime and manufacturing and construction and on and on are seen as good jobs is because workers struggled and they fought to make them good jobs. And capital will never ever provide us with sustainable future financially rewarding jobs. Our goal is not to legislate um, fairness, but to remove legislation that prohibits work and people from fighting for it. Too often in our movement, we're told by parliamentary comrades not to worry about taking up issues by organising workers. Just bring them along to a committee and we'll do a workshop. We'll pull, put it into a policy and, and everything will be OK. And I appreciate the fact that there's an openness to champion our ideas, but that shortcut does a disservice to workers and to working class politics. It was Tom McDonald, I think, who said that in order to create enduring social good, we must first win it in our workplaces. We have to organise, win in the workplace, and then we legislate later. Missing that important step actually cheats us out of our strength in many ways. It cuts working class ownership of our ideas and campaigning. It prevents workers to be able to have the debate on their own terms and to self-inoculate against the conservative attacks. And importantly, it, it removes our ability to test the opposition to private capital with smaller private audiences of our members. The first step in building a bigger industry and fairer jobs is to take the chains off hold, that are holding working people back from organising. And we, we can prosecute the case to our members that they should be involved in a bigger political push if we can first demonstrate to them the power that they have in their hands and the power that they have in their workplace and teach them how to win. And there's no wonder that workers have got a level, level of apathy and a lack of confidence in politics at, at the moment when they can't even take collective control of the conditions under which they're going to work. And it come as no surprise to anyone on here that you have a trade union official arguing for a return to the right to strike. But that's just the beginning. Workers have got to be able to take action on more than just their wages at once every three years. And these punitive and partisan bodies like the ABCC and the ROC have got to be abolished. To us, the biggest ask must not be some suite of legislative that are worker-friendly policies that, that can be repealed or cut or bureaucratised, but simply for the parliament and legislation to get out of the way and let workers organise and exercise their power. So don't mistake um, our preference to win in the workplace and the streets as a rejection or participation in de decision-making, no matter where it is. Uh, we all know that disruption um, th that we've seen in Brexit and with Trump and that is just working class frustration fueled by decades of divisive politics, media and public discourse. And I, I, I'm not going to pretend that electing a few more working class people to, to, to our parliaments will fix that trajectory that we're on at a, at a global level, but I also know it can't hurt. Now workers can't be part of defining a problem, uh, sorry, workers can't be part of defining the problem if workers can't be part, part of defining the problem, sorry, the solution, solution isn't for us either. We have to end this idea that, you, that we've got to professionalise politics, uh, but that also comes with a mutual obligation. One is that we should introduce political quotas into our parliament that a certain number of candidates on the Labor ticket or any other party should require them to have hands-on work experience, put more working people in, back into our parliaments. And secondly, trade unions have got to be unafraid to ask more of our trade union and political leaders and to invest a lot into supporting their activism and their confidence. So workers can play a pivotal role in building innovation, a fair and sustainable future, but they need a place at the table. And workers can see pretty quickly when they're just being used as a ticker box exercise or being used for what's a, um, the thing recently is just this high vis cosplay for bosses and politicians to stand next to a worker in a high vis but only authentic, thoughtful worker participation can deliver a vision that's for everyone. We need to accept that policymakers and politicians don't always have the answer. And I think I'm being very generous when I say that. The lived experience of workers that we need to win and that they need us to win most is vastly different to many other people. And I would urge that we need to think about the way that workers see and experience political in in engagement. The best way to build a movement is to let us start in the workplace, build the confidence of workers to win, support their struggle with political activism and influence, and deliver sustainable change in our parliaments. 
Organised and politicised workers can deliver transformative shifts in power, thought and outcomes. We've seen it in the histories of our own movement and we still see pockets of it. Acts of small resistance and solidarities by workers every day, particularly during the COVID crisis. What we need though is to unlock that potential and to build a future that's bigger, fairer and smarter and encourage workers to do what they do best, to organise, to fight and to win. Thank you. That was <clears throat> fantastic speech, Steve. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. And I love the political angle there at the end. I think that's spot on, actually. Uh, but I'll <clears throat> it's not about me. So we're now going to move on to the, uh, the audience and the membership to um, ask some questions of the speakers. Um, basically, uh, a lot of questions have already come up on the chat. You can continue to put them up. I'll try and move through them chronologically, I think, because um, we've got some monitors who have grouped them into themes. So what I'm going to do is actually call on <clears throat> Ralph first, uh, who's asked a question about casualisation, to ask unmute and ask his question and also indicate who he's directing it to. That's all right. <clears throat> Thank you, and um, thanks to the three speakers, and uh, thanks that everyone recognised the lands and the traditional owners of the lands. Um, I've been very concerned about the um, evidence that's emerging during COVID of the impact of casualised workers on casualised workers of the situation. Um, and it bothers me that we seem to have a situation where employers can save money by casu having casualised staff without proper terms and conditions of employment, but we, the society, pay the cost. Not just during the, the pandemic where casualised security staff and casualised people in aged care homes have, have um, been at the forefront of the, of the issue because they've had the work, but it seems to me that it's a broader issue about the cost to society of employers skimping on workers' rights and conditions. So perhaps um, Steve might be the first person to respond, but, but can we find a way of enforcing a situation where employers have to pay the same amount in total costs, whether they have casualised or permanent staff, and the government perhaps recouping that extra money so it can provide for things that casualised staff are denied? I think it's a very interesting question, to be honest. Um, we, we've been dealing with the, the scourge of um, insecure labour or uh, precarious labour or casual labour or labour hire for many, many years. We've tried to do it through enterprise bargaining um, and you're really restricted as to how that, that works. I think the recent case that was led by the CFMU Mining Division around a casual worker uh, being there long time, uh, uh, sorry, long term, uh, and, and then getting a ruling that said that that worker was in effect a permanent worker and should be entitled to leave, yep. um, simply exposed the fact that this was a wrought by employers that had been going on for a long time, and we're getting a lot of voices from employers at the moment now saying that they they are if that is the case they will move away from having casual employment on an ongoing basis and move to a a part time arrangement because they have to. Um, effectively have um, the lead provisions um, set aside anyway. It's a good thing for workers, of course, because once you're part-time, you've got set hours, you're a little bit more secure. Um, with a casual, you can be let go at an hour's notice. So, you know, this is a good win for working people Then we get these things up. We've known for a long time that these jobs have never been casual. They've never been short-term. They were simply about exploiting workers and removing workers' power. And that's a good example of how we could use it but employers will still find a way around. And, you know, I've never been one to say we should fix this by going to court. Um, you know, you go to the Fair Work Commission or any other court, it's set up, stack with bosses anyway. Uh, we should win it on the job. You just got to take those shackles off workers and they will, they will win that struggle. Great, thanks for that, Steve. <clears throat> I'm going now to Julie Fraser, who's got a question about um, fracking, the fracking agenda of the Labor, it sort of goes to the political question that Steve raised in his speech. Are you there, Julie? Yeah, yeah, I am. Hi, everyone. 
Um, yep. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so in the Territory, we have a Labor government, uh, a right-wing Labor government. It's basically pro-fracking. Um, I'm a member of the Labor Party. I'm a unionist. I've been a unionist all my life. I'm a teacher. I've been a nurse and a midwife. Um, so I've spent my whole life working for the community, I would say. Um, but uh, we're finding it very difficult to convince our government to have a seat at the table for everybody. So we have been pushing that in lean. I think that's very important. Um, there's a group, a coalition, which is forming here in Darwin. So it's fantastic to hear from you, Steve, that uh, you're gonna develop this campaign uh, because there are progressive unions, but there are unions who aren't so progressive. Um, and same the Labor Party. So there are progressive people and there are people outside the Labor Party who are more progressive as well. So I think what we've got to do is build a broad progressive coalition because uh, it's going to basically take all of us. But I agree, I think organising and activism, wherever it's going to be. So it's happening in our schools with kids. Uh, so it should be happening in unions. It should be happening in community groups. Um, but, and I know there's a lot of feeling out there in the community, so I agree with you, but people don't know how to stand up because we haven't, people in unions who have been staunch have had to do it for a long time, but a lot of us haven't done it. Uh, so I suppose that's my question is, how do we move away from the neoliberal agenda? How do we do it at speed so we can actually address the climate crisis? Were you addressing that to one particular person, Julie? Or? Look, I don't mind, whoever wants to take it up. So I'll just, any of our speakers prepared to take that one? No, um, I'm happy to. Steve, yep, okay. Uh, well, I think one of the things that we've learned, and I didn't cover this tonight, but pe people may have read it um, in the newspapers or seen it on Twitter or something, but. Um, we've been thinking since the last federal election about the fact that working class people were thrown at environmental environmentalists um, and were, were, were um, in, in these regional communities told to pick a side. And there is um, no surprises as to where working people um, landed when you chose to choose between the environment and a job, your family's financial security or a greenie, people are coming down on the side of their job. Uh, and the truth is that that is not where the conflict really exists. Uh, so we've, at the AMW, we've been working with Lean and with a number of other environmental groups to say that when workers' politics gets ahead of the environmental movement, we can win. And we saw that during the Green Bands and Jack Mundy uh, and the BLF. We saw it when, um, during Work Choices, is when we put aside our differences and we work out we've got the same values that were after the same outcomes and we start to work together um, we realise we've got one common enemy, and that is private capital. And once you realise who the enemy is, people put together a plan, and once they get a get a plan together, you get action. And you know, it's it's about working together in solidarity to deliver justice for working people. At the moment, we've got um, communities all through the Hunter where I grew up that are genuinely worried about what their future is, but they know that something is going on. They don't trust politicians or bosses to fix it. So, and unions aren't saying anything. So it's incumbent on us all to make sure those conversations continue, that we're building alliances, that we're building strength and we're putting work and people at the center so that they can determine what the future is. Excellent. I'm gonna to go to, um, this one's for Mark, I think. Um, Kate Cooper, about fossil fuel, fossil fuel miners and why can't they mine other resources for batteries and the like. Well, they can, and some of them are starting to. Um, yep. I mean, uh, it was BHP made a decision a couple of weeks ago to power their mines with renewable energy. So now we have solar powered coal mines in Queensland. Try getting your head around that. Um, uh, you know, we, we are seeing uh, serious interest in you know, lithium mining and some of the rare metals minings, um, not without some issues as well. Um, I think the point that was made uh, by Steve about, you know, the protections that have been 
one, and why we have good jobs in construction and mining is because unions have fought for it for many years. Well, there's a lot of work to do to make sure that these new jobs that are emerging are actually good jobs as well. Um, the ACTU has been working with affiliates on, a, on some research, which we're releasing in a few weeks about the status of jobs in the renewable energy industry, for instance, where they haven't been as secure and as well paid um, as they have been in the fossil fuel industries. Um, but yeah, there's, there's absolutely opportunities to reorient heavy industry, heavy industry reorient mining. Um, we're we're going to have to still pay close attention to industrial issues, to environmental issues. Um, but, you know, while, you know, I think a lot of people who have not been deeply in the climate space for a long time, look at something like the Chinese announcement yesterday around getting to net zero by 2060. And it just sounds like it's decades away or it is decades away and it sounds like it's too little too late but the actual when you look at the size of their economy and their emissions the, the, the trillions of dollars that that means are going to be pouring into new technology new transport um, new new uh, into renewable energy technologies is just extraordinary it's going to be like nothing we've ever seen before um, so, so there are these opportunities that we just need to seize make the most of and make sure that they actually deliver for, for workers and they deliver for communities. Yeah, can I just add to that briefly? I'm just, uh, and thanks to Steve and Mark for terrific presentations. I, um, I think it just highlights this point that, of course, there are huge employment opportunities in renewable energy and energy efficient buildings and uh, all, all the work that's needed to, to get to a low carbon economy. But, it's not guaranteed that there'll be there'll be great jobs. I mean, there'll only be good, secure jobs if uh, if you know, if uh, yeah, people fight for that. And as as Steve said, you, the union movement has to be absolutely central to that. So it's one thing to say there are you know, and, and it's a critical story that there are really uh, many jobs in the you know, the, the new economy, the, the green economy, but. Uh, we just need to make sure that we don't just assume there'll be good, secure jobs. That has to be one. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think, um, yeah, good point, actually. Um, and a recent Australia Institute report commented on our potential to value add to mineral, the mineral lithium and actually make our own electric vehicles here in Australia um, and soak up a lot of that unemployed labour market in old industrial regions, um, why are we just exporting um, <clears throat> all our um, raw materials, you know, and not value adding? So some great opportunities emerging, it would seem. Uh, but I'll go to uh, Janine, Janine, is it? On um, training, transitioning to new manufacturing using robotics. Are you still here, Janine? Yes, I am. Hi, yep. can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I would love to see the trade union movement uh, take a, a, a greater role in, in uh, training and qualifying and upskilling people to, so that they can transition to these new technologies. Um, certainly a lot of uh, jobs, uh, you know, a lot of people just sit and forget. I, I know quite a few people, I live out at Campbelltown in New South Wales. And, and they, they had basic TAFE education 20 or 30 years ago or 10 years ago. Things are changing constantly. And it is very, very hard for workers. Um, I think that the unions have a role to play in transitioning and, and probably need to help with the restructuring of TAFE. Um, did you want to take that, Steve? Or or was that, we take that as a comment? Well, what do they think? Do, 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 because uh, I, I mentioned this once before and a lot of people said, no, it's not the role of, of, of unions to, to get in, involved in training. I can tell you there is training done. And mm -hmm. certain things in the, in the ACT branch of the CFMEU. I, I know it's a priority, TAFE is a big priority for the ACTU. Um, Unfortunately, it's been gutted in a, a lot of places, mainly by state governments, but um, training pathways, um, 
rebuilding TAFE um, are, are absolutely union priorities and, and things that each union puts a lot of time into thinking about the, what, what, are the, what are the training pathways for people in their industry um, from apprenticeships through to TAFE education um, and then quality accreditation of work on site, et cetera. So yeah, it's absolutely a union priority. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm going to go to Wayne on um, worker-owned cooperatives. Are you here, Wayne McMillan? No? Yes, I am. I'm here. Okay. Can you ask your question? Yeah, look, I, um, I've been a member of a union. I've been a member of several unions, but uh, I'm still, in, I've retired, but I'm still a member of the Public Service Association of New South Wales member for 36 years um, what appalls me is that you know unions have lost influence I'm a third generation unionist and they've lost coverage in the private sector um, they're dwindling in the in the public sector but not as bad as in the private sector I'm thinking that maybe we need a new focus strategically and I'm thinking I'm not saying that worker owned co-ops are the are the only solution to the problem but I do think that we need to think about funding startup worker co-ops. And that might be a way of getting around uh, the, the new relationships in terms of work because work has changed. The old 20th century employer-employee relationship is no longer with us. But unions seem to be thinking that we've got to operate from the workplace. Well, how do you operate from a workplace when people are working from home or they're working at McDonald's or they're working somewhere else? You, it's very hard to organise. John? Well, I was going to, uh, I noticed, I think Dan Musel is on the, on the call and uh, Dan knows a great deal about uh, the role of co-ops in the Latrobe Valley um, and in the, the renewable energy industry. And I just wondered if Dan wanted to uh, uh, have something to say about this. Yeah, sure, Dan, are you here? He was here I am. before. I am. Oh, yeah. good. Um, oh, good. Can well, you chip in on this one? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, thanks for the invitation, John. Um, and I, I've really enjoyed the presentations from everyone so far. I think they've covered a lot of ground and, and um, I've agreed with, with a lot of what people have said. And I think that question that's just been asked is a great one as well. I think there is real potential in um, having a, a deeper reimagining of the role that workers can play in the economy. And I think worker cooperatives where workers directly own the means of production um, and collectively manage their workplaces um, do offer a lot of potential in not just for realizing the kind of more democratic and ultimately sustainable economies that we might want but also in reinvigorating um, unionism and reinvigorating what political activism might be so i think it's a great question um, as, as john mentioned uh, the earth worker cooperative is one example where um, we're working to set up a whole network of worker cooperatives around Australia and, and the kind of flagship one is one here in the Latrobe Valley in Gunnarokona country where I'm speaking from um, where we've set up a small manufacturing cooperative to manufacture solar hot water products so we're trying to be an example but I think the potential is obviously much greater than the small steps we've taken so far so I think it's a great question I'd, I'd be really keen to hear what other speakers said as well. So I'd invite um, either Steve or Mark to chip in on that question if you wanted to, or happy uh, to. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love workers' co-ops, and you know, Earth Worker is particularly inspiring. Um, just the broader question around declining union membership. Um, I mean, that's been an issue for very many years, but I, I feel like it's an issue that the union movement is actually addressing reasonably well at the moment. Um, ACTU and affiliates have really prioritised growth and many unions have actually been increasing their numbers through the pandemic. And that's quite, um, quite an achievement. Um, you know, it's quite significant increases in numbers. And I, I think if anything, the pandemic has shown uh, people the relevance of unions and the value of unions, particularly in places where people are losing their jobs. It's, you know, the, there's the, the first call people are making is to their union. Um, so uh, yes, absolutely up for reimagining 
workplaces and reimagining business structures and community control, um, et cetera. Um, but also I don't think we can just uh, assume that those, those declines in young numbers of union uh, membership are inevitable, uh, they're reversible. And um, I think there's a real will across the union movement to do something about that. Okay, we might leave that one there. Um, <clears throat> um, Kate Cooper, have you, are you still here? Uh, Subsidising the fossil fuel industry. Okay. Um, okay, Wayne, has, Wayne McMillan, have you already spoken, Wayne? Yeah, I've already asked your question. You've already asked yours? Thanks. Okay. That's fine. I let somebody else have them. Okay. Um, so one thing on yep. the work of cooperative things, and it's something that we're exploring, we're talking um, uh, with BZE up in the Hunter about the future of work. Uh, and there's kind of two ways you can look at it. One is that workers have a cooperative where they own a particular business and, and they run it as a board. The other model that we floated up was that uh, we have a workers cooperative that supplies labour. Um, uh, to businesses uh, across a particular area or a particular project that ensures that workers get a say in, on what their wages and conditions are and that no worker can be exploited or, or employed outside the workers' cooperative. So workers get some level of control and, and are able to bargain as a collective for a whole project um, rather than looking at uh, piecemeal approaches or just owning a part of a business. So it's a different model that we were talking about with them that should also be thought about as well, having worker cooperatives being the provision of labour. Yep, good point. Um, I'm going to go to Rory Cummins. Is he, is he still here? <clears throat> okay, he had a good question. Um, his question was on um, a strategic, do you think we have a strategic plan for workers to be involved in a more progressive way to bargain for better conditions? I believe the movement needs to get government to legislate similar to what has happened in Norway, Sweden and Germany, where companies with more than 200 employees have a company assembly comprising of 12 shop floor employees who vote the appointment of the company board, which will comprise of minimum of a third of company employees. So, um, yeah, sort of <clears throat> industrial democracy, I guess, sort of question. Um, did you want to, did, did you have a view on that, Steve? Oh. Um, we've seen a couple of examples where that's happened. Yeah. Um, I know that um, the Curry Aluminium Smelter had a similar type of arrangement for a number of years where workers did have a couple of spots on the board. Uh, it's about how they're used and um, you know what, what the communication is out of it. A lot of workers, it was new for them and they accused the, the representatives that were on the board of being in the company's pocket whenever they made a decision that wasn't in the interest of, of workers. So it was a really difficult thing. Um, it, it wasn't, um, I, I would say, not, not a successful model for the way that that communication was run, but that's not to say that having workers on the boards um, wouldn't um, also deliver some level of fairness and at least to say uh, on behalf of working people about big decisions around the future of the business. Um, so I, I would like to have a look at some successful ones to be able to offer some more views. Okay. John, did you have anything on that one or are you? Yep. Is Don Sutherland still here? Don, did, you've made a few comments. Did you want to oh, say anything? Oh, thank you, Sarah. I didn't yeah. uh, expect this, but um, yeah, my comments have really been directed at um, that yet again, we're hearing a hell of a lot about policy and a lot of confusion about the difference about policy and strategy. And I think what Steve was doing was introducing the concept of strategy to ultimately have the power to win a policy or a program, whatever you want to call it. And I think the discussion about strategy is pretty pathetic, actually, not just, I don't just mean in this particular discussion, but generally, Julie was, refer, was touching on it and grasping at it as well. But overall, if we want to achieve the changes that must happen, particularly those that must be substantially in place by 2030, if we are to have any chance of having a good life for workers and their families by 2050, 
we must have far more power embedded in the working class, not just in unions, but including in unions, to win it. Because they, the enemy, are not going to give it to us. We are going to have to confront them. And there is going to have to be strikes and the like to win. And we can't hope for that to happen. And that's where Steve is dead right. We've got to build right from where we are at now and stop wishing that suddenly we have the German scenario or the Swedish scenario. We have to do it on Australian terms, enabling Australian workers to take the power. And that's where Steve is raising the issue of strategy in a way that is going to come under enormous attack from within the ALP, but most driven along by the fossil fuel corporations. So my question is, how do we elevate the discussion of strategy? Steve, I'm feeling this might, might be one for you. <laughs> you... <laughs> I, I like this concept of the Just, yeah. capitalist class. Like, um, that's an interesting thing. Um, but I think Don is right. Like, strategy is where we want to get to. Uh, and and too many times we we just focus on on what the tactics are or how to how what a silver bullet might look like that would be an easy fix or that's not what working people do we identify what the cause of our problem is and we talk to people about it and we socialize it and we work out a plan to get on top of whatever it is uh, causing us um, an issue or, or a struggle and we work together to win it. Um, and the one thing we probably don't do enough is celebrate it and learn from it and then win again. Um, so I think yeah, having a strategy there, um, which I've kind of outlined our, our union strategy that will put a lot of meat on the bone over the coming months and launch it probably next year. It takes a bit of time to do this right and get members involved in it. But we won't blink once we get our members on board is that we need to get uh, other unions and other organisations, community groups also supporting it. As Don said, um, the AMW and myself will come under attack for calling out fossil fuel companies, uh, for calling for fossil fuel company donations to be banned until uh, we sort out um, what our future energy needs are and we land on something to stop uh, these energy companies from donating politically until we're able to make some decisions in the best interest of our country and the best interest of our communities. All that stuff is going to be controversial and yep, we'll come under attack, um, but that doesn't mean we should blink either. Um, what it actually requires is a whole of movement approach that says that we do deserve a better society, a better share, and we do deserve to have justice for working people. And when we're all on that page, um, I, I, I do believe that we will win. I feel like we've exhausted um, most of the questions, actually, because we a lot of them are repeating material that we've already um, asked. So unless anyone else from the panel wanted to make any final observations. Um, oh, I had a question. Oh, sorry. Who's, um, Wayne, is that you? <laughs> okay. I'd like to say that Go for it. The, the future leaders are coming up with those young school striking kids. They're going to be in the workforce soon. So they're the people that are already getting the condition of being radical. John, you look a little too comfortable. I reckon with the NTU struggling at universities, you got to lead by taking, kicking out the vice chancellors and working into how ordinary lecturers are going to be running universities. And, and, and though uh, Jack Mundy is a fantastic example of struggle, we have struggles internally as well, because even Jack Mundy was stabbed in the back with his own union members, you know, the others that kicked, uh, knifed him. Um, uh, what was his name? The guy from Victoria. Uh, so we have to take these arguments in every sphere in our lives. Uh, and the ACTU, bloody poor, poor Sally McManus couldn't answer the questions from Kerry O'Brien the other day when he was putting on the table to her that the ALP started all the privatisations and all of the neoliberal economics. And she, you have to say, yes, they did. And we're gonna reverse all that. Now on a more gentle note, Steve, how are you gonna try and help the CFMU, B, 
be more realistic and not be so divisive in terms of uh, not supporting the mining industry and the general iron hearts of this world? What kind of conversations have you been having with them? I think the um, simple answer to that is that every single union across the country is having discussions about um, the, tra the, the transition. You know, if you talk to workers about just transition and Green New Deal, they just think they're going to get a TAFE course and get screwed over. That's, that's the short of it, whenever you use those words. The CFMEU, politically, it's a very difficult conversation for them to have. A lot of their members out of the last election, where they had worked with Labor to develop what a transition plan might look like, um, decided to fall on the, on the side of voting for their job security and believe that any conversation about uh, transition means a loss of their job. So the conversations that we're having across the union movement, and we will continue to have them with any union, including the CFMEU, is that this issue belongs to all of us. The solution of it, there is no silver bullet. And if we're not actually organising now and having conversations with the workers and the communities that are directly affected and letting them shape what the future jobs are going to look like, then these communities, when the decisions are made in overseas boardrooms, will be that these, these towns that we know currently, where I grew up, will be decimated. There will be no jobs. And the people will lose their homes, they won't be worth anything, their kids will have to move away, and we've got a chance now to build an alternate future, to bring jobs and investment to regional towns and show people that we are serious about securing their future, to show them a job that they can touch and feel that is just as rewarding and just as well paid, and, and the conversations that we've been having is that workers aren't loyal to coal. What they are loyal to is a well-paying job and their family's financial security. If we can create something else, they'll shift tomorrow. Um, and that's the job that we've got in front of us when it comes to this transition, is winning the hearts and minds of working people, but most importantly, giving them a voice at the centre of the discussion so that they're in control of uh, what that future looks like. <clears throat> Unless there are any more questions from the floor, I think I might, because I've looked at a few of the last ones and I think we've definitely covered the ground that they're covering. So, um, uh, um, hang on, Janine. Okay, Janine, we'll finish on you. Uh, have you already asked a question? I think you have. Getting the government to mandate projects. I already have. I, I think government procurement and supply yep. chain especially with the, the, the way to recovery would be that they, yeah. they, they mandate some projects, uh, yeah. not the old, infra, the, the old infrastructure, some new tech ones so that people are upskilled with the new tech at the same time. Right. Yep. I'll take that as a comment. Um, I think I'm going to throw to Julia now. Um, as I said before, unless the speakers have any final comments, I think no. I think, yeah, I think we'll throw to Julia now to... Um, to, uh, sorry, go back to my agenda. Throw to Julia now to wind up uh, the meeting. Um, and um, I'd like to thank all the speakers, myself. That was absolutely fantastic. Very generous of you um, in terms of time and effort to go into those to the fat three fantastic presentations um, and great, great discussion. So thank you again. And uh, I'll go to Julia now to finish the meeting.